Is it recording now? One must not get one's knickers in a twist. I'm trying. These are the stories your granny never told. Clint Eastwood loved my apple pie. I was raising a cow and 50 sheep and two chips. I slipped upon some spilled onions on the road and crashed my motorbike. Hey everybody, it's your host Nikki of the Stories Your Granny Never Told podcast. It's a monthly podcast where I interview people from a wiser generation about the unexpected stories from their youth. This is a special month because it's the sixth episode. That means it's the six month anniversary of Stories Your Granny Never Told. Woo! Um, to celebrate, go buy some stickers or something on the website. It's also a really, really important episode because after like two months of technical difficulties, I finally was able to record and upload this sort of Black Lives Matter episode. Obviously, it would be ideal to have a black person or person of color or indigenous person interviewing on the podcast. Um, and I'm going to work towards that in the future. If you're a grandma or your grandma is BIPOC, Please just like email me and I would love to have them on the podcast and tell their story. I'm definitely working on that. And at the end of the episode, I'll share a list of podcasts led by black podcasters so that you can have their point of view on the whole Black Lives Matter issue. I'm not personally going to address this. I'm a white girl. You know, I'm just trying to use one of these episodes with its history and bring light to the matter in the small way that I can. You know, I'm outrage that we actually have to say that black lives matter it should be automatic but this is where we're at now so i just wanted to focus on how you can be an ally and you know it seems like not much progress has been made since the 50s in terms of when integration happened so i brought on dr angie benham to share her story of how she stood up to her school for her fellow black students and hopefully it's something that can inspire you to also be an ally. So as a little bit of a background, Jim Crow laws or segregation laws required African-American and white children to attend separate schools. And in 1954, the Brown versus Board of Education case was a Supreme Court ruling that ended public school segregation. But in 1957, the Little Rock High School in Arkansas decided to not follow this court ruling and the governor called the National Guard to not allow the black students to enter the high school. Later that month, the president sent federal troops to escort these nine children that are known as the Little Rock Nine back to the school. So their names are Minnie Jean Brown, Ernest Green, Melba Patillo, Terrence Roberts, Elizabeth Eckford, Thelma Mothershed, Gloria Ray and Jefferson Thomas, as well as Carlota Walls. And in Arkansas, schools were still not fully integrated all the way until 1972. So Angie's going to tell her story of being a high school student at that time and how it felt to live in this historical moment. I'm sorry that we had to, uh, we had all these technical difficulties and we had to do another one, but at least you got to uh, kind of have a rehearsal. <laughs> <laughs> well maybe we'll see what the outcome is <laughs> if you could give us your name and your age and uh, start from where you grew up okay my name is Jesse Angeline Evans Benham and uh, I currently go by Dr. Angie Evans Benham now that I'm a psychologist and I hope people will recognize my name <laughs> And I've been called Angie since the first grade. Okay. It's the computer responsible for my being uh, listed as Jesse, but that is my legal first name. I grew up in Van Buren, Arkansas, mm -hmm. which is 160 miles northwest of Little Rock. Okay. It's right on the Arkansas River and it is between. Uh, the river and the foothills of the Ozarks uh, Plateau. Sounds beautiful. Well, it is. It is beautiful. When I was um, growing up, there were a lot of, um, where I lived was in 
East Van Buren. Our house was a bungalow on a dirt road, and we had a city bus service which connected Van Buren to Fort Smith. But at that time, Camp Chaffee was open. And so that meant that there were many, 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 many soldiers oh. uh, in the area from all parts of the country. And it also meant that our high school had some teachers uh, from the north. Uh, and that was unusual because okay. we were very insular and isolated. And even though we, our town borders on Oklahoma mm -hmm. and is only 100 miles south of the Missouri state line, people didn't travel very much. So there were very few influences. Okay. Our town population was between four and 6,000. Okay. You know, Arkansas has always been a poor state, but especially then. And we're thankful though for Mississippi because it was even more poor than we were. Mm. And uh, it was a, a pretty frugal kind of society. My, uh, my dad was always trying to make more money, and he usually had a little corner grocery store. Mm -hmm. I got to run it in the, the summer of 1958, um, just before the immigration crisis. Right. So that's the, the whole reason for your interview is um, because of, in 1958, the law got passed that there would be integration and normal segregation in public schools between black and white kids and that started at Little Rock and then there was all of these riots there and Little Rock decided to close down right because they didn't want to do integration um, and then your school also had problems with it uh, but you were a junior right when you were in that high school yes I was a junior that year at Van Buren High School right so how did that all go down well <clears throat> Two years before Van Buren High School had integrated, and there were very many problems. There were some that nobody really knew about, uh, some altercations and things. But what made my junior year different was that Governor Faubus had said that even though the Supreme Court had ruled that desegregation had to happen, mm -hmm. uh, Governor Faubus said, no, we don't have to integrate. And so he sent National Guardsmen to Little Rock Central High. Right. And those National Guardsmen kept the nine African-American students from entering. And then what happened just before my junior year was that Little Rock closed its schools right. as a white to um, not integrate. Meanwhile, the... Um, President Eisenhower sent in the 101st Airborne Division to make integration of, of the Little Rock School happen. Mm -hmm. But when they closed the school, this fueled some people in Van Buren's desire to avoid integration. Yeah, they decided to follow the example. Yes, yes. it was Little Rock was very influential. And even though it had gone on pretty well the two years before, uh, in the fall of 58, uh, effigies were burned mm -hmm. and uh, there were students carrying placards uh, that were very rude and hateful, saying, go home and so on. And uh, a school board meeting was called by these, uh, they didn't call themselves the White Citizens Council, they just called themselves the Citizens Council, mm. the feeling encouraged by the Little Rock event, they demanded a meeting with the school board. And that's when I and some of my friends that I invited went to the school board meeting. Meanwhile, that afternoon, just before the school board meeting, the student council had polled students at the school mm -hmm. and asked them their feelings. Because they wanted to know if the students really were against integration or if it was more like their parents or the locals that were influencing them, influencing them, sorry. Yes, uh, I had learned about taking polls that summer before because as president of the student council, I went to a workshop. Oh, useful. What was interesting though, is that that conference, which had 
students from all over Arkansas in attendance in the form of student council presidents. Integration, desegregation was never mentioned. In my, hmm. to my knowledge, never heard anything. Because it was taboo. Yeah, it just was not brought up. Although it seems like they would have talked about that, but it was not talked about. Right. Hmm. So how come you decided to go to this city council? Well, I think there were several factors, um, some of them very adolescent and some I'm still proud of <laughs> that influenced me. But I didn't want to not have high school. I loved school, not just because it was a place of learning, because it, all, it wasn't always uh, inspirational as far as learning. Sometimes it was. Mm -hmm. uh, but high school was the total social realm. Yeah, You know, that was fun. I didn't want to miss out on that. So that was one factor. Uh, another factor was that I was upset about what was happening to the black students. Uh, they, um, they were there. They were very quiet and well-mannered. But one day at Langston's Drugstore, which was the closest drugstore to the high school, and it's where sometimes we would go eat lunch, Mm -hmm. I don't remember what day of the week it was, but I saw one of the black students there working. He was a little younger, maybe a year younger than me. And he was pushing a broom. He didn't look up at me or the other students, but it was very evident that tears were rolling down his face. Oh. And that affected me because a boy that age in our culture, does his very best to never cry in front of other people. So I knew he was hurting. Mm -hmm. As soon as the integration problems began with the effigies and, and the meetings and the hue and cry and the boys. And, and to interrupt, these were your schoolmates that were burning these effigies and like protesting and stuff in front of the school, right? Yes. Now, I don't know. I still don't know who all those protesters were. Or probably like 16-year-olds and... Yes. Okay. Uh, the one or two ad cars would race their motors and drive up close to the school and receive attention. And they were missing school every day also. Yeah. They are just doing it for the attention and... Yes. And that was to cause a ruckus. To anyway. That was my belief. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I, you know, to take the side of an adolescent boy, though, they, we don't have a way in our culture to establish that you're a man or becoming a man. Driver's license is about as close as it gets. Yeah, that's a good point. That was one way to do that. And then the boys I did know who were on strike, they called it, Mm -hmm. They had never liked school, so I think they didn't want to go. <laughs> okay. Uh -huh. And of course, some of them, I'm sure, were influenced by their parents. Maybe yeah. Most of them, because the little tiny kids don't really know how to hate. No, they. It's a learned thing to learn how to hate people. But I'm sure some of them were influenced by what their parents were saying. Mm -hmm. So my stand, though, came about from several influences when I decided to attend that meeting that night. Uh, I tried to get to the bottom of this, as we say around here, when uh, uh, an outsider said, you must have been told by somebody to go do this. Mm -hmm. And I've tried to remember and I've asked questions about the influences on me, but I have never come up with anything other than just the way I grew up in the summer's event. And I, my dad would often talk about uh, how everybody in the United States has the right to freedom and the opportunity to seek happiness, mm -hmm. to make their life better. Uh, he was big on the Constitution. My mother, on the other hand, often talked about how people's feelings got hurt. And so when I said, how do you think you make those Negro children feel by keeping them from school? Mm -hmm. That was really from her. And then my sense that they had a right to be there was that both my parents respected the law 
and thought we should keep the law. And my dad liked and respected the chief of police. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't think he really realized, and I didn't either till later, that that chief of police was saying that those students had a right to strike and they didn't need to go to school if they didn't want to. So he was against integration? Yes, he was. Mm. And his wife was at that meeting that night. How did that meeting go? Well, it was just back and forth, a lot of angry arguing on the part of the, the citizens group mm. until after, a, it seemed like a long time, I raised my hand and asked, would you like to know how the students feel? And mm. the crowd there said, yes, yes. And there was really no one there saying we should integrate. Yeah. The school board was saying, well, this is the law and we need to abide by it. But they but, weren't really happy about it. No, a lot of them were for segregation. Hmm. <clears throat> but when I asked that question, the citizens group said, oh, yes, yes, yes. And so... Because they thought that the students would agree with them, I'm sure. Yes. So when I made the results public, oh, they were upset then. And because most of the students um, didn't care about segregation, they, they wanted integration to happen? Yes, the results, I think there were 85, four, and 40 undecided, and the rest of them uh, were against it. Okay. So uh, they, they, the crowd was upset and really said bad things. Uh, and the police chief's wife, and I never told this story until mm -hmm our previous attempt at this podcast yeah. because I, I didn't want the police chief's wife or her children to be hurt. But it's my belief now that she is deceased and even her child, who was a little bit younger than me, is deceased already. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm not worried about that now. And now I have kind of ignored that her statements for so long, I'm not sure exactly what they were, but I think what she said to me was, I hope you grow up and either marry or get raped by the biggest black buck you've ever seen. That was her comment to me. <laughs> wow. How can you say that to like a kid who's just representing the school and as a full adult think that that's okay? Yes, she was a full adult, and I don't know, but people... That's terrible. I know some people do lose their reason over this issue. They get angry. Because I got a lot of, of uh, letters in the mail, and later, my mother told me that she had become aware that they had to hire another part-time person for the post office to deliver the mail. There was because of all the letters you got? And that's because um, there were journalists at the meeting, right? And it, it blew up. Yeah. Like you, you were in all the papers. And I was really not aware of them because they were in the very back and the shadows were over them because of the balcony. Mm -hmm. And they were very lethargic looking <laughs> when things... And they were there because nothing was happening in Little Rock since the school was closed. Okay, so they're like, maybe something's going on here. Yes. When all the shouting began, they jumped up and uh, recorded what happened mm -hmm. and took pictures of the, the friends, the student council members who were there. And it hit the, the national magazines. Right, you were in Time magazine, right? Yes, Time and Life, a two-page spread in Life. Wow. And uh, Look and oh. And my grandchildren like it that I was in Seventeen magazine. Okay, cool. <laughs> that is <laughs> pretty cool. Later as, as an honor and also Mademoiselle um, magazine. Oh, yeah. They, they elected you Woman of the Year. Yes. <laughs> and there were silver medallions they gave me anyway. Uh, the honor is there. <laughs> so you got a lot of hate mail, but also positive mail. How did that I got, yeah. work it out? It seemed to me that there was more positive mail than any other kind. Good. But I know there was hate mail because a lot of people called me communist. Oh. And in that day and time, that was about the worst thing you could call somebody. Right. After the N-word, I guess. 
not yet. <laughs> there was a tremendous fear of communism taking over the world. and It's all based in fear. That did a uh, duck and cover, too, for the to atomic bomb. So Oh, you had to train for those? Uh -huh. So there was a lot of fear. So I, I never understood why they thought I was a communist. So somebody explained in their letter that I was being used by the communist or, and was one because mm -hmm. integration would undermine the schools and make the United States weaker and therefore communism could take over. Oh, well, guess they were wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's always been reaffirming to me that Fort Smith started a high school to avoid integration right after that. But the, mm -hmm. the main honors and achievements have been at the traditional high school where most of the uh, black students went and I guess still do. Although Good. Southside is integrated too. And Southside just dropped their uh, rebel flag or designation. Recent. Right. That's all stopping now, which is final. I mean, it took long enough, but finally that's happening. Yes. What what kind of uh, people sent you mail? I know we talked about last time you got mail from New Zealand. Yes, even New Zealand from the Maori organization. That's and so I great. really enjoyed that. Yeah. The one that I got some from um, famous people, but the ones that I enjoyed the most were from missionaries who said this helps us talk about God's love because people have asked us and these were people in Africa and other places people have asked us why do you tell us God loves us when you treat African Americans so terribly mm -hmm. in the United States yeah which is a pretty good question yes um, and I also appreciated the a Christmas card from one of the women in Little Rock who headed up the effort to reopen the schools. And she said, sometimes little children leave us. And that's what I felt like because I was very upset. I mean, I, I was so young, I didn't realize that you can do good and get in trouble, just like if you do bad, you'll get in trouble. But if yeah. you do good, you might get in trouble too. But the consequences to my family were very upsetting. Mm -hmm. um, and I didn't know this until years later. And I knew those former things I just mentioned mm -hmm. almost immediately, and I was upset. But I didn't know until years later that some people came by my daddy's store and some people said, we're going to do business with you, George, because we appreciate what your daughter did. But others came by and said, we're never coming in here again because of the blankety blank kind of girl your daughter is. So that was hard on, on my parents, but we never talked about it. Terrible. They would say, your meal's on the table, but we never talked about it. Hmm. And even at school, there was a calm but kind of frigid air and many of the black students were sent to live with relatives out of state in, like in California so they could go to high school because the high school was not available unless they found a way to get to Fort Smith. Yeah right and and you said before the black community was kind of outside of town, so it was much harder for them to get to school, right? Yes, they had to find uh, transportation across the river to Fort Smith uh, in order to go to high school. They had thought they could come to Van Buren and they could walk, most of them mm. could walk to the high school, but they were disallowed. How many, approximately, how many black students were there in, in your school? Uh, I think the maximum enrollment was maybe 21 or two and then okay. uh, 13 and then down to maybe only five. Did you ever get to speak with them about how that went down? No, I didn't. And that's one of my regrets. I really didn't get to be friends with the black students until uh, years later. Mm. And uh, 
I was ill at ease. I'd never been really around any black people. And I was a teenager. And so I didn't know how to. As ha what happens when you have a segregated school. <laughs> yes, yes. Years later, when I was at Georgia Tech, uh, one of the persons who worked there talked to me one day. And she was from uh, Poughkeepsie, New York. Mm -hmm. And she, she didn't know my background, but she said to me that uh, she was so worried about her son. That he's, a, he's still a young man and he's very dark. And I'm so afraid of what will happen to him on the streets of Atlanta. Mm -hmm. But, you know, Atlanta's been termed as the city too busy to hate. And a lot of that was true back then. Okay. It was more progressive than a lot of Southern places. Right. And, and a professor I had uh, for the clinical part of my training was a black man. Mm -hmm. And he's the one who told me about the sundown cities. What does that mean? Any black person had to be out of them by sundown. Oh. They could drive through them, but, but he told me. And then when I went to work, there's, there are theories that high blood pressure is rampant among, the, among black men because of the oppression they feel all the time. I mean, yeah, I can imagine that uh, you'd be stressed out more often. And it's still happening now. Right. And there's still white friends who say, I don't know what white privilege is. Yeah. And maybe you have to be in the minority to understand that. Uh, but, I mean, white privilege has many facets, but one of them is not being followed when you go in a store by somebody who's going to wait and see if you're going to steal something. Yeah, not being afraid of the police for really minor things. Yes, yes. You know, it should be easier than that to just put yourself in someone else's shoes and think, well, if I had their life, you know, it wouldn't be great. So we should make things better for them. But I guess for some people, it's really difficult. Well, and that was why that summer before that school board meeting was so important, because I spent that summer reading the Bible. I'd made a recommitment to my faith. Mm -hmm. And I read the Bible all that summer, because mostly what I was doing was selling penny candy. <laughs> but uh, I read the Bible, and a lot of it reiterated what I'd learned growing up and learned primarily from my mother. One of the things she said to me was, to whom much is given, much is required. And okay. we were very average in, in income mm -hmm. and lifestyle, but she made me realize that I did have a lot just because I had opportunities. Yeah. I, I had white privilege. Yeah. And it, I, I didn't know that name then, but um, she made me understand that. And then I came to the conclusion that, that summer that if it's not about love, then it's not about God. And I don't understand how Christians can look down on anybody. Yeah, it doesn't say anywhere in the Bible to look down on black people or any people for that matter. No. I assume. It doesn't. It says to love others um, and love your neighbors, whoever they are, as yourself. Thinking about how other kids feel, mm -hmm. a lot of that came from my mother because her dad moved in from the country so that his daughters, my mother and her sister, could go to high school. Right. And uh, my mother had to wear dresses that were not uptown. I don't know if they're made out of flower sacks or what, <laughs> but she was made fun of in high school. And so she knew how that could hurt yeah. a teenager. Yeah, especially when you're a teenager. It's, it's your whole world at that moment when things like that happen. Yeah. And you yourself are the center of that world and everybody's looking mm -hmm. at you. <laughs> yeah, and I can't imagine what it would be like being one of the only 20 black students in a extremely racist part of the country at the time. Yes, and it, there was lots of ignorance. Yeah. Um, thank goodness for the people who shone a light that reduced some of that ignorance. And there are many teachers that I'm thankful for. I remember our biology teacher said to us two things, and she said the first one, because we would hear her, it was so unusual for her. But she said, it ain't necessarily so. 
and she told a story about somebody who visited Japan and came back saying there are no pianos in Japan. They hadn't seen any pianos, so that's what they brought. Relativity. Us. So <laughs> <laughs> she helped us do some critical thinking. And Important. her daughter was two classes ahead of me. And her daughter is the person who offered to walk with the first African American graduate of Vanderen High School. Oh, great. You know, during the processional. Mm -hmm. She offered to walk, and their house got spray painted. Oh, wow, and their, because of that. Yes, their screens cut, uh, and so on, and they moved out of state right after that. Shame. So um, there were a lot of people who did the right thing and, and suffered consequences for it, and I really didn't suffer too many consequences. Well, you weren't treated great as a teenager. I mean, it's kind of nuts, but... um. It's a it's a great thing that you did because you kind of started a movement or you at least helped the school not to close, uh, which wouldn't have happened if you hadn't spoken up and haven't you know acted as the head of the school student council. Yes, we'll we'll never know what <laughs> been, but I am I am proud of it. Proud that I took that stand. Now um, I do regret I didn't become friends with any of the black students till years and years later. You met some of them later on? Did you meet some of them later on, like at a school reunion? Yes, at a class reunion, the class ahead of me, a man named George Hudgens came and attended that. And uh, I talked with him over lunch. My husband and I met with him and, and he said several things that really impressed me. One was that his behavior was guided at that time just as what was normal. So it was normal for him to get on the other side of the street if a white girl was walking along mm. and to not have any exchange with her. Well, we know that was a wise thing to do when we look at the story of Emmett Till. What was that? Emmett Till was allegedly said a provocative thing or was flirting with a woman and he got killed for it. Oh, wow. And he was only maybe 14 or 15. Oh, man, what a um, shame. But then George went from Van Buren High School to um, Arkansas Tech mm -hmm. University. And uh, one of my cousins attended school there and said that students threw cornbread at him. Uh, so he went through a lot. But what I remember the most when we talked with him was that after he had become a second lieutenant, and he went on up the ranks wow. in the military, but he was traveling with his wife and baby, and the baby was crying, and his wife was crying because they couldn't buy milk late at night. Because they couldn't stop anywhere? Either people wouldn't serve them, or it was just too scary to stop anywhere? People wouldn't serve them. They even stopped at motels that had Uh, a restaurant mm -hmm. with it and ask if they could buy milk out of the back door and people refused him Ugh. and he said I was so angry yeah he could adjust to many things because he said that's just the way it was back then but some things it really got to him but I'm I'm glad to have met him and talked with him Do you see some parallels of what's going on today and, and what's happening with the Black Lives Matter movement? Yes. Um, I think that now, with all of this, we may make great progress, much greater than has been made in the past. In the past, laws were changed for the better. Mm -hmm. And there was a way for people to get jobs and to go to schools that they'd never gone, been able to go to before. So that's good. But now we're getting down to the more the emotional terrain. Yeah, maybe laws have changed, but some minds haven't. Exactly right. Mm. And now things are, I think, have a chance of improving uh, at an emotional level. Do you think that this experience is what brought you to become a psychologist or was that related in any way? Um, well, at the time, I said I wanted to be a social worker mm. because I knew I wanted to help people. Yeah. 
but good start. Uh, I came, and a lot of this impetus came when we lived on the Navajo Reservation, and I continued with my question of what made some people want to do well with their lives and really work hard to do well with their lives versus why some people just gave up and drank or wasted their lives. So the psychology part came uh, because I wanted answers to that question and specifically, how can I help people do better in their lives? And uh, how come you ended up living on the Navajo reservation? Uh, we were missionaries there. And that's where I learned what it's like to be a minority. Huh. Yeah. I would, I would, I would uh, look at myself in the mirror and be shocked because I was so white <laughs> compared to what I saw all day. Because my husband is one half Native American. Okay. And his family's life was changed for so much the better. Uh, because missionaries came to where they live okay. in western Oklahoma, near where Fort Sill is. Uh, and we went out there, and I remember now the first question that Navajo people would ask once they decided to talk to you was, how long are you going to stay? <laughs> yeah, because you're <laughs> in their territory <laughs> now. Uh, well... It was also because they would get attached to people and they would leave. Oh, yeah. That happens a lot in um, like Hawaii because of all the military comes there and then they leave every few years. Yes. Mm. And that happened out there, the teachers and so on. Oh, and that's sad. <laughs> so I shocked myself by being such a different color. And then one day a Navajo woman about my age said, well, she was talking about something. She said, well, you know how it is. I can't remember her name because all white people look alike. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but we were out there doing our best to to say that God loved them, and and it was not always received well because one one woman who lived across the street from us, uh, as part of the bootleggers family. Um, hmm. said, no, I, I want to go to hell because that's where all my family will be. <laughs> all right. <laughs> I think she was probably um, baiting me, but that's what she yeah. said. And a Hopi man told us about how a snake came in his hospital room after he had a wreck and healed him. Oh. So it was a little bit more difficult to uh, stick with your own ideas. Everything was um, upside down, as you said. Well, that's what I would, would ask. So I imagine a lot of the people in the Native American reservations still keep their Native American traditions and religion. So how did that work then, being a missionary there? I'm honestly just curious, would you try to convince them or more generally just help them out? Or how does that go? Well, um, that's... I've got a million answers for that. <laughs> Part of the answer is that the tribes have very different religions yeah. from each other. And uh, a lot of them have fallen away from their original religion. The ones that are more intact, like the Hopis, yeah. people will still make trips to go back to the reservation for healing ceremonies. But Many of the Native Americans have gone to school enough that they have become very uh, scientific or secular in their sure. beliefs. And so they're in a deficit situation looking for something to guide them. But, you know, we have trouble getting it right. So Christians <laughs> also reject and talk about hate and and uh, do a lot of things that are not at all God-like or Christ-like. Yeah. What it would be like now, we talk about what it would be like and sometimes wish we could go to another reservation because a lot of them are in 
great need of good news. Yeah, that's for sure. Right now with the pandemic, they they're getting hit really hard, especially the Navajo. I I read. Yeah, they still don't have um, running water like they should have out there. Very yeah. little water, and they haul it just like they did when we were out there. Man, when you were there, were you able to get some answers to your question of sort of uh, the differences in in uh, people's mentality and state of mind? Um, well, I hadn't been to school yet when I was out there. Okay, but that's just what triggered it for you. Did you get an answer for yourself after school? <laughs> I'm still trying. I'm still looking <laughs> for that. But I was a sophomore for 13 years. Okay. <laughs> so um, that's when we had our children and we were too far away from any college, 75 miles yeah. from any college. But I think that one big factor is simply physical health. Mm -hmm. If a person is healthy physically, then they've got a platform, a basis for doing a lot of good or a lot of bad. And I think the second big influence is, of course, parents, how well the parents love. Yeah. And it, one of the findings in psychology is that it's very difficult for a person to conceptualize God other than a replica of their own earthly father. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. So my dad started some of my questions because if I spilled the milk, you know, childhood things, he would say, what made you want to do that? <laughs> <laughs> As if you had a choice. <laughs> yes. So I both hate and respect that question he, he posed. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, one's consciousness of how you fit in the universe even comes in from your parents, I think. And I, another quote I remember is from a professor I had when I did get to go back to college. And it was the most wonderful educational experience I've ever had. And I have been to many schools, but it was Agnes Scott College uh, in Decatur, which is a suburb of Atlanta, Georgia. Mm. And it was a private women's liberal arts college with a faculty to student ratio, I think of seven to one back when I was there. Wow. It's still um, very, That's great. Really you know, small classes. They read everything you write. <laughs> mm -hmm. One mm -hmm. professor said, "Can't get away with anything." <laughs> one professor said, um, "It is very hard to be brutalized and not become brutal." Yeah, I was never brutalized Psycho. except, you know, unless you want to count uh, some of those letters that I received, or the <laughs> lady who waited on me after school and would come out of her house and call me lover um <sighs> but there's a good ending to that story okay good that whole year maybe maybe she stopped when it got cold i don't remember but <laughs> years later she was in the hospital where my mother was my mother broke her hip and mm. that lady didn't know my mother but she said to her i need to apologize to you and she told her what she used to do to me on my way home from school And she said, mm -hmm. but I'm different now. I have love in my heart now. And I don't feel wow. that way anymore. And I'm sorry. And I'm a Christian now. That's, that's what she told my mother. So I don't know exactly how my mother felt because this topic would bring up lots of distress Yeah. in my parents, um, although they never talked about it. But You know, they did come by and say, we're never trading with you again. And then <laughs> I can laugh about it now. And I'm glad that I've come this many years away. But the director of our church youth group mm -hmm. sent hamburgers to the boy strikers while they were on the strike. <laughs> well, everyone was against you. <laughs> But for that, that lady, I mean, it's. I guess it's good that in the end she saw the error of her ways and change. It's not always that that happens, even though it took her so long. Right. It's better than nothing. 
Right. And I can't imagine the amount of abuse a black student would have if you were already getting that much hate. Yes. And, and see, that's another part of white privilege. People notice black people and take things out on them just because of their color. Just because they can. And I wish we could go by what Martin Luther King Jr. said, is that everybody should be judged or accepted or rejected on the basis of their character. And not the color of their skin. Right. Yeah. So. I I do hope, like you said, that things now will change going forward. I hope that, you know, action is going to be taken. It It seems slow, but hopefully... Um, eventually we'll get there and it is a pandemic now i mean it really feels that way and it's yeah. uh, you know i remember watts the riots there and that was horrible but we've had some and more i think than even we had then one of the things i meant to mention if i've got time do i have time for one oh yeah absolutely okay this is an influence on me in addition to my dad's talking about the rights under the Constitution, mm -hmm. uh, my mother, I remember, one summer day, <clears throat> got out the big black pot and put it out in the yard and built a fire under it. And she asked me to help her. Well, I was not real good help, <laughs> uh, but I was there at least. And she was saying, oh, I wish, I just wish I had Missy Glass to help me today. Missy Glass was a, a black lady in our town of Van Buren. She, okay. she did get hired by white ladies to help with work around the house. And my mother said, I really would like her help to wash all these quilts and blankets, but I wouldn't think about paying her so little that a lot of people pay her. Yeah. So I had an idea of what was just and right from from my mother in many ways. I do have to admit that both my parents were prejudiced. That's part of growing up there. It was part of the times. But still somehow slightly more forward thinking for the time. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I heard many years later about my grandparents. He took the part of some black people who were who were being mistreated in another town in Arkansas and stood up to the sheriff. Oh, good. So that's where you got it from. I also heard that my maternal grandfather, the one who came to town so his daughters could go to high school, that mm -hmm. when a little black boy was being abused in the neighborhood by bullies, white bullies, he went out and put a stop to it. Good. So both sides of the family were like that. The people are not necessarily coherent in their thinking. Yeah, not necessarily. We're seeing a lot of that these days. Um, a lot of really strange, like complete cognitive dis dissonance. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> I've been so pleased with how many young people are out um, showing their stance for justice and acceptance and all of those things. Yeah, it's so important. I'm, I'm proud of everyone who's out there as well. I mean, it's, 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 it's going to be a world-changing event, I hope. And, and I think in the future, we're going to look back and it's definitely going to establish some kind of history. Yes, I think so too. Oh, I was going to tell you all ago that um, none of our parents except one set knew what we were going to do that night that the student council went to that meeting. Oh, so you snuck out. Yes. Well, see, we were allowed to go to school functions. So if okay. we told our parents, we're just going to, to school tonight, to mm -hmm. a meeting, that was okay. Even though we got home after dark, it was still yeah. okay. And then the next they day they found out what actually <laughs> happened. <laughs> yes. The next day, the local newspapers had the story. And then in a few days, the magazines did. And my husband, who was only a friend then, did tell his parents and his dad said to him well you know there's going to be trouble but mm -hmm. it's your decision and, and you think at the time if your parents knew they would have let you go no i don't think so because they, they said, were scared for you yes yeah they would have said it's too dangerous 
course, this in 1958, there were lynchings of black people, but white people weren't being killed yet, hmm. as far as the news portrayed. So I didn't think it was dangerous, although that night when we walked home after the meeting, my cousin and I lived close to each other, and she had gone with me. Um, she was a senior in high school that year. And we walked home on the railroad tracks, which was the straightest distance to get home. Mm -hmm. um, but no cars would see us there either. Yeah, a little dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> I guess you were really a rebel when you were a teenager. <laughs> <laughs> Not really. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, and oh, you're, so you and your husband were high school sweethearts then? Well, the very last part of our senior year, we started dating. Before that, we were just friends. Okay. But we ended up in the senior play together. Oh, and that's sweet. Uh, he got to drive the family car during that time, and that's how we started dating. Okay. And, of course, we can talk about differences in families. <laughs> right, because he's half uh, Native American. Well, and then <laughs> his youngest brother... There are three boys. His youngest brother got his own car in the 10th grade, but my husband, David, didn't get to drive the family car for the very last part. The youngest is always the little favorite anyways. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I knew you'd catch on to that. Yeah, I'm the oldest, so I know. <laughs> I know how it goes. <laughs> you know what it feels like to to resent that also yeah if you let yourself huh? if you let yourself <laughs> well <laughs> nowadays there are more cars to go around it's okay <laughs> that's true that's true and the economy is better and and when i was in high school what people wanted was a television set and a car and to live in their own apartment or house it's not too different nowadays instead of a television it's like an iphone or something but otherwise i don't know if many of us can afford a house but uh it's it's on the list yeah that's changed for yeah. worse <laughs> well my closing question is always if uh you have some advice after all of your experience um for my generation well of course i do i'm old so it's time to give advice uh, <laughs> Choose what you think is important because if you put in effort, you're going to achieve a percent of what you think is important. So make sure it's, it's worthwhile. That's and I, I do feel that I have chosen the best part. Of, of all of your goals? Well, of what's important about life. Yeah. So set a bunch of goals because you're going to end up achieving some of them anyways. Yes. That's a really good take. Most of the time, it takes most of our energy to, you know, to achieve the one that's most important to us. And that's how you know you're doing it right. And uh, that's my advice. I have many thoughts about that, and I don't know where you want to go from here. I'm still working mm -hmm. because I, we didn't choose money and a good retirement. You chose just to help other people. Uh-huh. And that, I think, is the most worthwhile. Um, and my husband made less money than the dishwasher at the government facilities like hospitals and schools made out on the reservation. So the good thing about this, though, is that I had one of the best experiences of my life not long ago. Oh, really? Yes. I do psychological evaluations. Mm -hmm. And the law is, is that if a husband or wife is a U.S. citizen or at least a legal resident, mm -hmm. then if they're under a great hardship, the court or the judge may decide not to deport the spouse who is illegal okay. or to help them come back sooner than they would have recently, you know, otherwise. So I do these evaluations to look at their mental and emotional hardships you know, other psychological problems. Mm -hmm. And it's not always heard. In fact, one evaluation that somebody did was of a person who was paralyzed and in a wheelchair, unable to move hands or legs. Mm -hmm. And the judge said, no, nope, they're just not under enough hardship. 
okay <laughs> excuse me so what i tell clients is you better be praying for the judge that reads this because that's going to make a huge difference mm -hmm. well one woman that came in her husband was in the detention down in the woods of louisiana they said if you escape you'd have a real hard time ever making your way yeah well he was detained there because he was such a bad criminal he had a dui oh. <laughs> and he was an immigrant yeah yeah so he was in jail and his wife came in and she was so upset that the second time i saw her i don't know how many weeks later she didn't even look like the same person wow but when she came in she was pretty much just beside herself and she had a uh, her little son was not quite three years of age mm -hmm. he was with her and she just could not really handle him she was too upset so she was trying to talk to me and use english because i don't understand spanish but her little boy kept jabbing me with looked like a um, card mm -hmm. kept jabbing my leg with it and saying something to me and i finally got around to saying okay let me look at it and he, he was jabbing me and saying poppy 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 mm. i looked at it and i said no that's not your poppy's picture on there that's your mommy's card mm -hmm. but he kept insisting over and over again and i got a statement from his babysitter who said that he has changed totally different than the child he was mm -hmm. that now he hits the other children that I take care of and um, he calls one of them Gordo you know that word yeah <laughs> okay <laughs> so I started doing some research because I'm, I'm not a specialist in children although I and it said a child who is three is able to do a kind of logic I thought about this and I said I think I know this is I'm going way out on a limb but it seems to me that this little boy is saying give us a card like mommy has and then my poppy can come home oh wow so I mean that would be logical that's just like yeah pretty smart for such a small kid yes it so happened that a female judge read this case okay and that day and I heard this from the their attorney and she texted me and said this is the best case i have ever had as far as winning wow she said not only did the father get released but he even got to ride home with us that night wow that's so great because usually if they do release him it's days later and they punish him as long as they can mm -hmm. Not only was released, he was granted his residency. Wow, that's such a good success story. It is. It has thrilled me. Still thrills me every time I think of it. Aww. That's been a wonderful experience too. Um, oh, that's great. So it's really rewarding to still practice now for things like that. Yes, it is. And the uh, the you know the Bible also says in the Old Testament to welcome the stranger and uh, provide food for them and there you go don't do things like put them in jail for oh. what other people only get a fine for so yeah i i really appreciate first of all redoing the episode and and telling your story um because i think it's important for people from my generation to hear i hope i hope people that are subconsciously racist listen to it too and maybe figure out you know people have feelings i don't know i hope <laughs> yeah. but um in any case thanks so much for your telling your story and and um i appreciate it you're very welcome it upset me to think about those events for years and years and years it was 30 years before i put up a picture somebody made me from the life magazine mm. you know some of my family still doesn't agree with me yeah family <laughs> <laughs> yeah so they are what make us and break yeah. us. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good one. So we're lucky if, if they uh, help us heal too. But it's good to meet you, Nikki. I wish you the best. You too. Thanks so much. 
Oh man, Dr. Angie Benham has such a great story to tell, and I'm really glad I finally got to record it. The newspaper clips and photos from that famous day where she stood up to the school board are in the show notes section of the website at storiesyourgrandineverTold.com. I said that I'd recommend some other podcasts if you really want to get into the history of racism in America, as well as the current Black Lives Matter movement. There's so much to unpack and a lot more people can explain it way better than me. So you should go listen to, for example, my fellow NYC podcaster, Chris, and his From Where I Stand podcast. He has a really heartfelt, short and straight to the point episode about Black Lives Matter. Also check out Slay in Your Lane, which is a podcast led by two strong black women. I love it. NPR also did a black fronted series called Code Switch if you'd rather listen to the more NPR type episodes and also give Black Girl Nation and Black Girl Podcast a listen as well. Do what you can to end racism, not only in America, but all around the world. Follow Edna's advice from episode one and please go and vote. That's the most important thing we can do to have our voices heard. If you can, donate to Black Lives Matter and speak up when you see racism. So as a less dark and more casual side note, I also guested on Lady Teal Curio's podcast to talk about my day job as a sheep biologist. And I don't really talk about myself much on here. So if that's what you want to listen to, go ahead and check out Lady Teal's Curio's podcast. If you like this episode and you want to hear more episodes launch at the 14th of each month, you can follow Stories Your Granny Never Told on social media to get updates. It's at storiesyourgrandineverTold.com. We're also on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and Gmail. If you aren't really technologically minded, but you still want to leave a voicemail, you can use our inbox at 332-203-2059. And now you can also get merch. Just go to the website and click on the merch button. Let me know your feedback. Leave a review. I really want to hear what you think about the podcast now that we're six months in. Um, Yeah, so see you next month. And... Follow your grandma's advice, bake some cookies, and go and vote.